I'm just appealing to Enoch to say, Jews living around the time when the Old Testament is in its final it's phase like a of contemporary, formation. When we read Enoch, we're reading the writings of somebody who's at the earliest right stages right. of. So they're way more likely to get us in touch yeah. with the original meaning of the story right. than Christians later on. Azazel, one of the watchers, had taken it upon himself to teach men how to make swords, knives, shields, and armor. Bloody conflicts and ongoing military tensions mean that countries from nearly every corner of the planet are looking to increase their arsenals. And who, as the world's largest arms exporter, is right in the middle of it all? It's the United States. Asael, another character, taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and every instrument of war. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells as we continue in exploring our previous series, The Evil Powers That Rule America. I hope you're ready to get into another exciting episode as we explore the Book of Enoch, Azazel, and America. The Book of Enoch is a valued text that has uh, been valued over generations by the Jewish and Christian community. But for some reason, it was muzzled in silence in our Christian world, and now it's been brought back out. And it brings a world of context and truth as we understand those three rebellions that we picked up in that last series. Uh, this episode is going to help you not only understand those rebellions, but in the context of this Jewish literature, Enoch, it's going to open up a whole new world of understanding these evil supernatural powers that not only rule America, but rule the world. And I want uh, it to be said, I am not anti-American. I'm pro-Jesus. I'm pro the narrative of scripture that he fulfilled. But we must expose these evil powers. And that's what we're going to do here at Ring Them Bells. Prophetically, as priests, we're going to call out the good news of what we have in Jesus and what he's done for this world and declare that he is king. As we know, uh, in, in a peaceful world with nonviolent resistance, that's our path. And America has taken a different path. And that's what we're going to expose as we see these evil supernatural powers that rule America. I hope you're ready. I hope you're subscribed. Tune in. Here we go. The sons of God saw the daughters of humankind, that they were beautiful. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went into the daughters of humankind, and they bore children to them, both Peter and Jude reference this story in the New Testament. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but held them captive in Tartarus with chains of darkness and handed them over to be kept for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah. In First Enoch, the fallen sons of God ask Enoch to see if God would forgive them. Since Enoch had God's favor, they thought it was worth a try. In 1st Enoch, God rejects the plea of the fallen angels after Enoch reports to him. He sends Enoch down into the abyss. He descends to the spirits in prison to announce their doom. That's the point of analogy for Peter. Just as Enoch descended to the fallen spirits, so Jesus descended into the same realm to proclaim something to them. What did he proclaim? They thought that since Jesus was in the realm of the dead, they had won. Jesus told them they were wrong, and he rose on the third day to prove it. They were still doomed. Jude also tells us about the judgment of these angels. The angels who did not keep to their own domain, but deserted their proper dwelling place, he is kept in eternal bonds under deep gloom for the judgment of the great day. Extra biblical Jewish writers believe that demons, like those described in the Gospels, were disembodied spirits of the giants. They base this on the Bible's mention of dead Rephaim in the underworld, Jewish books like First Enoch, and the Book of the Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls make that point explicitly. And these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. 
then, at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We've got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay. Enoch, the book of Enoch, all, scholars refer to it as First Enoch. There's, a, there's actually more than one. But the first one is the one that counts because it, it dates before the New Testament. It is a, a piece of literature written by very theologically faithful conservative Jews, a Jewish writer. So it, it's a really good example of how Jews were thinking about Messiah prior to Jesus. Now, there's a lot of other stuff in the book that bleeds into the New Testament or that comments and shows you how Jews, and serious people, they think the Hebrew Bible is the word of God. You know, like we do, okay, but how they're thinking about the Old Testament, but also, again, you, you get this these streams of interpretation that when you get to the New Testament, it's like, okay, you know, if I had read the book of Enoch, I would think, I've seen this before. So it really cuts off at the knees a lot of these, these notions that New Testament writers are just making stuff up. Uh, they're not. They, they are firmly within one strand of what we would call intertestamental Judaism, and it, it's very interesting to see how they were handling Old Testament passages and how that compares with what the New Testament writers are doing. Um, so it, it contextualizes what New Testament content is, you know, about Messiah and about other things. The Book of Life, these heavenly books, there's a lot of stuff like that in Enoch. Lake of Fire, Final Judgment, just the general, you know, apocalyptic stuff, you know, that you read in the book of Revelation. Guess what? Enoch was there first, you know. So th there's there are these threads that just run through from the, the Old Testament through the Jewish, the serious Jewish community in between the Testaments on into the New Testament. The book doesn't have to be canonical or inspired to be useful. You know, Peter quotes from Enoch, Jude quotes from Enoch. There's stuff in the Gospels that, again, are directly traceable to, to things in Enoch. It, you know, it has its, its fingerprints on the New Testament in a lot Enoch of places. Enoch is a literary work from around the 3rd to 2nd century BC, so in the period of the latest formation, last steps of the formation of the Hebrew Bible. And it was an immensely popular work. And essentially, it's a interpretive retelling of these early stories from Genesis. Hmm. And it constitutes one of the oldest interpretations of the narrative in Genesis 6 that we just talked about. Hmm. And it fully identifies the sons of God as the divine council. And there's 70 of them. And they have actually a couple leaders. Yeah, I'm just appealing to Enoch to say, Jews living around the time when the Old Testament is in its final it's phase like a of contemporary. formation. When and we read Enoch, we're reading the writings of somebody who's at the earliest right stages right. of so they're way more likely to get us in touch yeah. with the original meaning of the story right. than Christians later on. So um there's a whole other layer too of how Genesis one through eleven is Israelite versions and readaptations of current ways of thinking among Canaanite and Babylonians. Oh. We saw that in Genesis one about like God tames the waters mm -hmm. with a word, you know? Mm -hmm. The waters aren't a rival, which any Babylonian would have read and been like, wait, where's your God battling the water monster? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. 
Right? Yeah, he doesn't have to battle them. He doesn't have to. So in the same way, Genesis 6 is adopting a very common storyline in especially Babylonian mythology, which is about... Div- divine beings. Div- yeah, divine beings. Procreating with humans. Procreating with humans and producing the great warriors and kings of old. Uh, that was just a common mythology. Totally. Most of the ancient kings were deified uh-huh. and presented themselves in their propaganda as offspring of the gods. Uh. And so you can see where this kind of story would just be a total jab. <laughs> All of that to be like, no, no. You know what? If there's any if there's any truth to what the kings of Assyria claim about being gods, mm. they're yeah. the offspring of rebel gods. Mm. And they are not gods. They're just flesh. Mm. And, and their days are numbered. And their days are numbered. The Hebrew Bible itself was created out of a bunch of pre-existing ancient Israelite literature and through uh-huh. time. Yeah. But it also came into existence during a period of great literary yeah. fruitfulness yeah. Of, the, mm-hmm. of the Jewish people. And so there's lots of other Second Temple Jewish literature that even some Jewish communities also treated with the same status mm-hmm. as the books of the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. And so you have to kind of think of a Venn diagram. You've got like Sadducees, they're running the temple. You've got Pharisees, they wish mm. they were running the temple. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the Dead Sea Scroll community, mm-hmm. and they tried they to run the out. temple, but they got <laughs> kicked out, and so they went out to the desert and hate everybody else. And then you've got the Messianic Jewish community, and what all and all the other writings, they take for granted that there's this kind of core I to see. the Aspen Grove. Mm. But there's also a lot of other literature yeah. that was accorded different status in different communities. Yeah. And so this is where the books that became the Deuterocanon or the Apocrypha, there's nothing Catholic or Orthodox about these texts. They're just Second Temple they Jewish literature. They are Jewish, yeah, Second Temple Jewish, Jewish literature. Yeah. These are the Maccabees. Yeah. This yeah. is yeah. Enoch. So Enoch, Jubilees, um, the Wisdom of Ben Sirah. Mm-hmm. And some of it involves second or third editions of Tanakh books. The question is, when you talk about the history of the literature... The development of Jewish literature didn't stop magically one day right. when the mm-hmm. Hebrew Bible was finished. Pens down. We did it. Jewish literature kept growing, and it all kept growing like a snowball, though. Just like the way um, the Book of Chronicles is riffing off of Genesis through mm-hmm. Kings mm-hmm. Uh-huh. and developing it, but in light of different things. So um, the wisdom of Ben Sirah is riffing off of Proverbs mm-hmm. and Ecclesiastes and Job and Genesis altogether. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. doing biblical theology. And so that process never stopped. Like yeah. it kept on going. Yeah. And so the question is, is the line where you say, okay, we're going to take this part of the tradition and this section of it as coming from God, but this part not. And so traditionally where Christians have done this is to say, well, what was Jesus's Bible? Mm. <laughs> the only reason I lead this, read this literature in the first place is because I follow mm. the Jewish mm-hmm. Messiah. Yeah. So what was the literature that Jesus referred to? as the scriptures that he said were about him. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he refers to the three-part shape of this literature that corresponds, as far as we can tell, mm-hmm. to uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh. The Tanakh. While Jesus and the apostles allude to and use language from other Jewish literature of the time, mm-hmm. yeah. they don't, as a general pattern, refer to it with the same type of status. Mm. But, for example, the famous saying where um, Jesus is like, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He's riffing off of a little line out of the wisdom of Ben Sirah. Mm. Oh, really? Which is where Lady Wisdom says, Mm. come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm. And Ben Sirah is riffing off of Proverbs. Ben Sirah is riffing off of Proverbs. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But Jesus doesn't say, as it says in the scriptures, Mm -hmm. Uh, or as it says in the wisdom of Ben Sirah, Mm -hmm. he just adopts it. And that's a pattern. Whenever Mm. Jesus and the apostles quote from or or allude to other Second Temple literature, they don't mark it with the same types of little markers as Mm -hmm. when they say, as the scriptures say. There's one very important exception, and that's in the letter from Jesus' brother, <laughs> Jude, uh, where he quotes from the scroll of Enoch mm-hmm. and seems to accord it, you know, with divine authority, mm-hmm. like you would quote from Isaiah, Isaiah or, or Jeremiah. Interesting. Or just, but that is the what he quotes and why is so fascinating <laughs> and rad. Because the book of Enoch is itself just riffing off of design patterns in Genesis and Deuteronomy and Isaiah. Mm. and So there needs to be a little humility Yes. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. man, this seems really important, right? Totally. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The boundaries of the collection. I think if we could go back and inter- interview Second Temple 
Jews and mm -hmm. d these different communities. Yeah. And we could say, like, what's in and what's out? I'm not sure that's even how they would conceive mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. collection. Hmm. Because think about it. That, where would you even encounter the collection? Oh, yeah. True. Yeah. It's yeah. not bound up in one It's not book. in one volume. Yeah. It's a collection, it's a collection of, scrolls. of scrolls. And not every tabernacle, what do they call them? Sorry. Synagogue. No. Synagogue yeah. Correct. is going to have the whole collection. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. But these are the texts that they're consistently going to be talking about. Yeah, and that's right. Hearing. It exists in their mind yeah. as a collection. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yep. But again, if we could just go interview your average uh, Jew in, in the Second Temple period, mm -hmm. they didn't ever see it in one volume yeah. the way we do. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have conceived of it as a book. There might have been a hierarchy in their minds of like, oh, yes. yeah, well, yes. that's, that's a scroll from the Tanakh. That's a scroll that I take very seriously over here, but it's not part of the Tanakh. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I think those are more of the comments we mm -hmm. would get is about how they viewed the relative authority the yeah. divine origins of each scroll, not whether it's in the collection or out. Even though the Tanakh did seem like a very complete collection that you're either in or yeah, out. Of. Yeah, that's right. But there were also other scrolls that were treated as having divine authority in different communities that are not a part of the Tanakh. And thus, there's the Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. That's right. Includes that's right. them. Yeah, Eastern right. Orthodox tradition yep. includes more. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, whatever the church community Jude was a part of. Very clearly, Enoch was a part of their Old Testament collection. Mm -hmm. That's why he quotes from it you know, the way he did. Isn't, um, That's Jesus' famously... brother. Uh, this all took me a very long time to yeah. come to terms with. Yeah. But um, if this is a question that bothers you or mm -hmm. keeps you up at night, uh, <laughs> you need to wrestle with it because it, it's a reality mm -hmm. that the boundaries of the scriptural collection differed in Jewish different Jewish communities. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to be a lot more humble in how dogmatic we are about yeah. these questions. The Enoch is a Second Temple composition, Second Temple literary work. Second Temple period, again in round numbers, is roughly you know, 500 BC into the first century. 70 AD is the technical end because the Second Temple gets destroyed in 70 AD, but 500 BC, to, you can round it to 100 uh, AD. And there are lots of Jewish thinkers you know, writing uh, books during this period. It's between the Testaments. That's why it's also called the Intertestamental Period. And the Book of Enoch is one of those. The oldest material we have for it comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are fragments of it in Aramaic. There's whole sections of it in Greek that come from the same period, the Hellenistic period, in, in secular terms, but the Second Temple Period when it comes to Jewish history. And it is in part a sort of retelling or elaboration is probably a better way to put it of the Genesis 6 story. Uh, really chapters 6 through 16 is uh, you know, an expansion of what happens in the first four verses of Genesis 6. Eden was lost. Rebel security guard was cast down. He brought death to earth, and now everyone would die. He became Lord of the dead. Since everyone would die, humanity would be his. Now, most people know the basics of that story. Christians believe it's why the world is the way it is. But that's actually incomplete. What happened in Eden was just the first of three reasons why there's so much evil and death in the world. Genesis 6 describes the second supernatural rebellion. Some of the sons of God, members of the heavenly council, transgress the boundary between heaven and earth. The sons of God saw the daughters of humankind, that they were beautiful. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of humankind, and they bore children to them. Genesis 6 recorded the second supernatural rebellion. The fallen sons of God were sent to Tartarus for their transgression. Tartarus is a Greek word for the realm of the dead, what we think of as hell. They'd stay there until the day of the Lord, at the end of days. A term like fallen angels makes us think of demons like the ones Jesus cast out. But the rebels of Genesis 6 are imprisoned, so they can't be the demons Jesus encountered. So where did they come from? 
The answer lies in the offspring produced by the forbidden union between the sons of God and the women in Genesis 6. Those offspring were known as the Nephilim. They were giants. Their descendants became the giant clans Moses and Joshua battled. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days and also afterward. In the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, we learn about the giants Moses and Joshua ran into. They not only descended from the Nephilim, but they are called by other names like Anakim and the Rephaim. That last name stands out. Several Bible passages describe the dead spirits of the Rephaim in the realm of the dead, again, what we would think of as hell. A literate Israelite would know, all well, these four verses sort of compress this story that, you know, is a really a response to Mesopotamia, because Mesopotamia has the same story. And they, the writer just sort of took it for granted that people are going to know what I'm talking about. I don't need to just rehash all this stuff. And this is a precursor to the flood. People living in the second temple period had the context as well. We just don't because we don't read that stuff. We don't read the, the, the literature of the great wider world to know these four verses in Genesis 6 are responding to something. This stuff in First Enoch is recovering or preserving or transmitting the larger story that Genesis 6, 1 through 4 was a response to. Okay, we lack all of that. And unfortunately, again, because of the history of the Christian church, we not only lack it, it's been kept from you. You have been cut off from it. From the time of Augustine forward, we have demythologized, we have stripped away, we have denied that the events of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 are supernatural. We explain away the Sons of God episode with, with the Daughters of Men. That wasn't the case, you know, for centuries, you know, since it was written on through the intertestamental period. There's a, an individual, Julius Africanus, you know, who prior to Augustine was the first one to sort of reject the supernatural worldview, but then Augustine did, and there are reasons why he did. He had an ax to grind, I think, with uh, some of the the material in Judaism and in the, in the Manichees, which was the Christian sect that he joined after his conversion, that revered the Book of Enoch and the Book of Enoch made a big deal out of this episode. And so when they had that parting of the ways, you know, Augustine is just not mindful of the need for the passage and frankly just doesn't want to hear anything about it. And so the rest of the church, because of his stature, essentially follows suit. And so ever since we've had views of Genesis 6 that make the supernatural context of it go away. Now, why haven't you heard this before? Well, there are a number of obstacles to it. I would say, again, just the way we're taught, there are points of incoherence in the way we're taught. You're taught to, to avoid books that are not in your Bible. Biblical writers read lots of stuff mm -hmm. that isn't in the Bible. They were like you. Surprise, surprise, they were people. And they read stuff. And what they read stayed in their head and some of that stuff helped them articulate points that they made while they were writing. It's, it's just a very human, normal kind of thing. For you to be taught to avoid reading that stuff immediately divorces you from the context of the writers. And so that my simple suggestion is, if you read that stuff, who, who cares if you think it's canonical or not? I don't think Enoch is canonical, but I don't really care. Because if you read it, you'll, it'll help you in some points follow what somebody in the New Testament is saying, if you just know what, what's sort of lurking in the background. Now, the early church, you had a few people defend uh, canonical status. In this book, I give you in an, in an appendix all of the places where some early church father quoted Enoch as scripture. They do do that. There are a few church fathers that also considered it sacred. Tertullian, going back here. Irenaeus, Origen, you know, kind of went back and forth. Clement, you know, back and forth. But Tertullian is sort of its biggest defender and Irenaeus uh, endorses it when one or two places, but Irenaeus pulls some of his theology from Enoch even without citing it. Now we know that because we have the book and we can go look it up, what he's quoting from. Uh, so these are some major, major figures. Wow, I hope you guys are enjoying this video as much as I am. I wanted to just check in real quick and make sure you're subscribed. 
it makes such a difference as we're trying to get this good news out. It only takes a second for you, but it means so much for me and the message and the good news of the gospel for what we're putting out. So if you could take a second, please subscribe, share this content. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey with us. In its original context, I'm guessing a lot of you have never read the Enoch story. So let's just go through some of the basic parts of it. When the sons of men had multiplied, and in those days beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. They said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget for ourselves children. And Shemhaza, their chief, said to them, I fear that you will not want to do this deed, and I alone shall be guilty of a great sin. So apparently it was his idea, and he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to only be blamed when this thing just goes to hell in a handbasket. And they all answered him and said, Let us swear an oath. Let us all bind one another with a curse that none of us turn back from this council until we fulfill it and do this deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another with a curse. Now, you notice the, the deed, again, is cast in, in sexual tones. You know, let, let's, let's go have children. But the real crime, I don't think we should miss. Again, if Unseen Realm, there's actually two views of, of sort of the supernatural perspective of Genesis 6. I don't want to... I don't want to leave this section without saying this. The real crime is that they want to raise up their own nations. They want, they want their own populations. They want to do, they want to, they want to imitate God without his permission. It's kind of a Gnostic flavor to that, if you know a little bit about Gnosticism. So the, you know, this, is, this is what's going to become the, the real issue here. They were all of them 200, and they descended in the days of Jared, or Yared, onto the peak of Mount Hermon. Okay, Hermon is the key location. And they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another with a curse on it. These and all the others with them took for themselves wives, and among them, such as they chose, they began to go into them and defile themselves through them. Again, they defiled themselves. This is a transgression of heaven and earth. To teach them sorcery and charms, and to reveal to them the cutting of roots and plants. And they conceived from them and bore to them great giants. Asael, another character, taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and every instrument of war. He showed the metals of the earth how they should work gold to fashion it suitably and concerning silver to fashion it for bracelets and ornaments for women. He showed them concerning antimony and eye paint and all manner of precious stones and dye. In a nutshell, what Enoch, first Enoch is saying here is, look, we know we had this thing the fall and we know people are sinners. But they consistently blame the watchers for teaching people how to be even better sinners. Okay, and in other words, giving them more tools to destroy themselves. Anything that, that we have you know, can be used to an evil end. And that's really what, what Enoch is going to be angling for here. And they blame part of it on people, the fall, because of just who we are. You know, our, our internal sinful impulse, the lack of, we don't have God's nature, God's character. We make choices to do evil. So people are, are going to get plenty of blame. But then people being taught again, how to express their own impulses, their own wickedness in various ways, that's a big deal in Second Temple Judaism. First Enoch 9, you have four angels, archangels, Michael, Sariel, Raphael, and Gabriel, send the terrible, see the terrible events unfolding on earth. They approach God for a solution. Basically, you've got to do something about this. You know, Look at what's going on. You have to do something about this. The four archangels say to God in 1 Enoch 9 to 11, You know all things before they happen. You see these things and you permit them. And you do not tell us what we ought to do with them with regard to these things. I mean, we're, we're here to help. You know, what should we do? God responds in 1 Enoch 10 with the news that should sound familiar to biblical readers. This is when you get the flood. When the Most High said, the great Holy One spoke, he sent Sariel to the son of Lamech, which was Noah, saying, Go to Noah and say to him in, in my name, Hide yourself, reveal to him that the end is coming, the whole world will perish, tell him that a deluge is about to come, so on and so forth. So in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 precedes the flood. Okay? It's just that in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, those four verses to us, key thought here, to us lack context. We read them and it's like, well, what does that have to do with the flood? You know, why are these four verses even here? I mean, you know, you get, you get to verse 5 and okay, the, everything that man does is wicked. We get that. And then 
Noah starts to have this conversation with God and then we have the flood narrative. Well, what do the four verses have to do with this? We lack the context. An Israelite, again, a literate Israelite, would not have lacked the context. That's the disconnect. The Book of Enoch. We saw the watchers descend from the heavens to have their way with the mortal women. This of course went against their original purpose, that is, to watch, and to never interfere with the antics of man. After some deliberation, however, the watchers succumb to their desires, and earth is plunged upon by these wicked angels. But after having had their way with the mortal women, the women gave birth to great giant monsters, known as Nephilim, that were just as wicked as their angelic fathers, if not more so. They wreaked havoc on the land, destroyed homes, fed upon the crops, the animals, and even the people. Before long, these beasts had even turned cannibal and were devouring each other's flesh in violent spectacles. But this wasn't the most insidious event taking place at this time. For around the earth, Azazel, one of the Watchers, had taken it upon himself to teach men how to make swords, knives, shields, and armor, and worse yet, how to use them. He taught men to kill each other, taught them warfare and strategy and barbarity. Amongst this, the other Watchers, including their leader Semjaza, taught the humans alchemy, enchantments, sorcery, and knowledge that God had not intended for man to use. With this, the world turned to chaos, and amongst the destruction of the Nephilim, the cries of the humans went up to the heavens. Here, those very cries are heard by the archangels Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel, who gaze down from above and see the carnage upon earth. They say to one another, the earth, made without inhabitant, cries the voice of their cryings up to the gates of heaven, and now to you, the holy ones of heaven. The souls of men make their suit, saying, bring our cause before the Most High. And this is the archangels interpreting the cries of the mortals, and understanding the severity of what is going on. So much so, that they realize they need to inform God. And so, it is to the Lord they go and tell him, Lord of Lords, God of Gods, King of Kings, and God of the Ages, the throne of thy glory standeth unto all the generations of the ages, and thy name, holy and glorious and blessed unto all the ages. Thou hast made all things, and power over all things has thou, and all things are naked and open in thy sight, and thou seest all things, and nothing can hide itself from thee. So yes, before actually telling God of the urgent matters on earth, they proceed to hype him up a little, and ensure that they pay the proper respect to God, showing us that they, unlike the Watchers, revere him and would never do anything of the sort that they have. In this, the text provides us with a clear distinction between Watchers and Archangels, in that Archangels are loyal, God-fearing, and forever under his command. The Watchers, on the other hand, are evidently quite the opposite. They then tell God of the crimes that have been committed, saying, Thou sees what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth, and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. It's quite interesting that of all the things going down on earth at this time, they first identify Azazel and assign much of the responsibility unto him. 
he becomes the sole watcher who has taught the mortals unrighteousness, and he becomes responsible for teaching them the eternal secrets, something which the other watchers were also complicit in according to the previous chapters. Yet Azazel appears to take responsibility for this crime, possibly because it was his teaching of warfare and murder that was considered to be the worst things that mankind had learned. Indeed, whilst the previous allusions to astrology, sorcery, herb gathering and alchemy were detested, the results of learning of murder and warfare far eclipsed the results of other lessons that the Watchers had disclosed. So whilst it's a bit unfair that Azazel takes responsibility for the other subjects that the Watchers had disclosed, he does kind of deserve it for the spreading of butchery and conflict. But furthermore, we understand that he is not accused of seducing the women, suggesting that Azazel was far more interested in spreading strife than he was his seed. Instead, Semjaza comes to bear the brunt of this transgression, as the Archangels continue, and Semjaza, to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates, and they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves, and revealed to them all kinds of sins. Much like Semjaza had predicted, in his earlier assessment of their dastardly plan, he would indeed take the brunt of the accusations considering that he was the leader and thus should have known better, or that he should have had better control over the others. Here we also see that the sin of their copulation with the women is explicitly highlighted, as well as their guilt in revealing all kinds of sins to mankind. For once, Mankind are seen as the victims, and not the instigators of said sin, and in many ways, mankind is seen as faultless. For even the Archangels can see that mankind simply would not have known any better. They do not proceed to blame mankind in their declarations to God, and seem eager to condemn the Watchers for what they have done. The Archangels most certainly set themselves up as our champions, for they are outraged at the indecency that is taking place, and even seem eager to set about fixing it. They show empathy in their witnessing of the restless souls who now ascend to heaven, and seem even saddened themselves that this has transpired. We should read all the stuff that biblical writers read. You know, drum roll, mm -hmm. okay. Biblical writers read books. Okay, what a profound thought. They actually read books. Right. And they read books that, in one way or another, helped them to make a point, helped them to frame some thing they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So if we read that material, we will just, by definition, become more intelligent readers of scripture. Right. So, I mean, I, th I think they're, for that reason alone, we ought to spend time with the material just, just so that we you know, can just become a, a, a close reader of the text, you know, to the best of our ability. Right. Now beyond that, you know, if, if you drill down into Second Temple literature like Enoch and, and become really familiar with it, you know, you'll, you'll know, um, you'll know why in many cases, why a biblical writer found this or that thought important, and how it it contributes to uh, it gives it explanatory power, right. you know, to a, to a certain passage. You'll be able to, to sort of read you know material through the through the eyes of the original writer and his original readers. They were partakers of, of their own culture. You know, they they read material, they thought about right. what they were reading, and again, in the providence of God, you know, God makes use of the stuff that you know we take in mm -hmm. uh, and they took in and it, it, it helps them you know to 
to write whatever it was they're going to write. You know, whatever God prepared uh, for them to produce, those things just become a part of what's in the tank. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys are enjoying this series. It has revolutionized how I look at the Bible and how I view myself as a Christian in America. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, share, turn on the alerts for this channel. All those things help us get the message out about what God has done for this world, and we're so excited to have you here along for the journey. Uh, this is a community, and I've loved uh, having all the response and all the connection that I've had with you guys across the globe. So, so thankful you're here. Tune in. Uh, stay tuned, as we always say. The beginning is near. We've got more coming. See you soon. The already but not yet paradox is an important biblical idea. On the already side of things, God gives us a new identity as his children. We belong with him as he intended. He also gives us a mission. We're here to grow God's family. The not yet part of our mission is what we often miss. The Bible says we will one day replace the rebellious sons of God in his divine counsel. We share the Messiah's rule in the new earth. Elsewhere in the book of Revelation, Jesus shares his throne with us. God and man will be reunited in fellowship. The dominion of the world will return to its proper sovereign. Heaven will return to earth. Eden will be restored.